from the book of Psalm, uh, Psalm number 100, verse number 2, the book of Psalms, and then Psalm number 100, verse 2. And it says, Worship the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. Worship the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. So we have come into this house, gathered in his name, just to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus and Christ, we come, Lord, worshiping you. We thank you for another honor, another privilege, another opportunity just to come before you. And Lord, we worship you for you are good and you are God. We praise you, Father God, for who you are, for what you do. We bless your name, Father God, for just being God by yourself. Lord, we praise you, Father God, for just, Father God, keeping us in our right mind. Lord, we honor you today, Father God, and we've come to hear from you by way of your word. We ask you, Father God, to forgive us for our sins, bless our lives, bless us to walk with you, and bless us to hear from you even on tonight. We pray, Father God, that your word will be real to us. We ask you to speak through your word tonight. Father God, that we will run and tell others about the goodness of God. It's in the mighty, precious, and powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. Amen. And thank God. Yeah, yeah, Lord. We've come into this house just to worship, to worship, to worship, to worship Christ. Worship him, worship him. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Did you come to worship him tonight? Amen. Amen. 
it is a precious thing just to worship the Almighty God. Amen. We come to worship Him. In our book, Unit 1, Day 3 is where we are on tonight with the understanding that you had a lot of homework. Let me try that again. Amen. We are in day number three. <laughs> well, y'all looking at me like Amen. junior high school students. <laughs> we had homework, right? Yes, sir. And homework is to make clear our discussions. So we are here tonight to make clear our discussion. We are on day three, unit number one. Day three, unit number one in our experience in God's book. And those who are listening online who don't have a book, you can open your Bibles and we will be reading the scripture first and then we will read the paragraph. There are scriptures in your paragraph. Everybody has their assignments that we will get to tonight. And if we don't get to your part tonight, then keep your assignments for next week. Amen? Amen. Let me thank Brother Euro C. Miles Jr. <laughs> for carrying on our invited study. Thank Amen. you so much. Amen. Brother, back in, back in Homer Street, we were called UC. UC. We want to thank yes. Brother Euro C. Miles Jr. for. See, y'all didn't know he was Euro C, did you? Uh -huh. Euro C. Miles Jr. for carrying on in Bible study. And so I hope y'all enjoyed getting out early last week. <laughs> and I hope y'all enjoyed getting out early Sunday morning. <laughs> because Pastor Davis is back. We want to cover as much as we can cover. God has given you grace in having me back here. Amen. Aren't you glad I'm back? Shout, shout amen. So we like to hallelujah. Look at that one. She's happy. She's happy because she knows that you got to spend some time in the Word of God to do it God's way. Amen. Hallelujah. What were the homework assignments? What was, what were the homework assignments? Somebody give me the first one. Talk to me about the first one. How and you had three weeks to do it. Look at God. Yes, ma'am. How are your rewards? How are your rewards cut when we get to heaven? Okay. What so, can we do to get rewards cut? Cut rewards is what I have. What do we do to get our rewards cut? What's the next one? While well, everybody's looking over their paper that they have answers to. What's the next one? Anybody else? Who goes before the judgment seat of Christ? Who goes before the judgment seat of Christ? What group of people? Go before the judgment seat of Christ. What's the next one? That one knows when do his is off her salvation. How does one know when he or she loses his or her salvation? How does one know when he or, he or she loses his or her salvation? What's the next one? What group of people goes before the great white throne for judgment? What group goes before the great white throne judgment? Is that all of them? Boy, I was happy giving out homework assignments, wasn't I? Is that the last one? We got about three more? Is that it? Okay, let's talk about the cutting of rewards. How do we cut, how do our rewards get cut? Or do our rewards get cut? Do our rewards get cut? Uh, Denzel Washington says, man gives out awards. God gives out rewards. Man give out award. When we have our turning hearts have their, their piano recital in there, they're, they're some enrichment camps. The children get what? They receive Award. awards, right? But God gives out rewards. The question is, would you rather have awards on earth or would you rather have rewards in heaven? Rewards. 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 
We want God to give us our rewards. Rewards. So when he gives us rewards, he gives us rewards based on what we have done on planet Earth. What we have accomplished, what we have thought, what we have said, the deeds we've done. These are our rewards. We determine what our rewards are. Yes, anybody has a scripture for that? We determine what rewards we receive. We make that decision. Okay, so how do you get your rewards cut? Who's answering? Raise your hand way up in the air, because I know you're excited, brother. This homework. Brother, brother Miles. I don't necessarily say you get your rewards cut. Uh-huh. Every reward that you gain here, you will receive up there. The problem is if you don't do what it takes down here to gain those rewards. Y'all hear that theologian talking? <laughs> he says, we worded this question wrong altogether. You don't get your rewards cut, but you get rewarded based on what you've done down here when you get over there. Yes? yes. So you, we have rewards based on what we do on this side of heaven. Yes. I have a question. Are the rewards the same as the crowns? Good homework assignment. Are the rewards the same as the crowns? <laughs> because when I Googled rewards, it came up crowns. Crowns as in several crowns? Yeah, it's, they are different than I just is, is it right. Now the next question is, yeah. are those crowns, several crowns per person, or does one person receive a crown? You get a crown for different things. You get a crown for different things? Mm -hmm. Is that theologically correct? Let's find out. So let's, what's that question now? What's the question? Are the rewards the same as crowns? Are the rewards the same as crowns? The second part of that question is, do we receive one crown or two crowns? Or do we receive several crowns? Or do we receive any crowns? <laughs> do we receive any crowns? <laughs> do we receive any crowns? We receive a crown per person is what the theologian says tonight. <laughs> Let's see what you all say next week. Good question. I mean, good. Y'all have some good homework questions. Thank the Lord. <laughs> you don't expect me to stand here and just go through my brain and answer this stuff off the top of my head, right? You want to answer from the word. Okay, so the question on the floor is how do we miss out on our rewards? Or how do we not, how are we not able to claim rewards? Or what can we do to receive rewards? Because I'm understanding Brother Miles was saying the rewards are not set up there for you. You make rewards happen based on what you do on planet Earth, right? Mm -hmm. yes? yes? How many of you have heard the senior saint says, I'm sending up timber? Yes. Raise your hand if you've heard the singer say, say, I'm sending up timber. What do they mean when they say sending up timber? Sister Woodlock, Brother Woodlock, what do they mean when they say we're sending up timber? I'm sending up some timber. I don't know what timber is. Isn't that wood? What is timber? <laughs> timber is wood, right? <laughs> Boy, he must be real young. <laughs> sending up timber, right? So when, when, when we talk about sending up timber, uh, the senior saints say I'm sending up timber. The reason why they said timber and not bricks is because we lived in wooden shotgun shanties. They can only relate to what they can see. And when they say they're sending up timber, they're sending up rewards. They're putting themselves in a position to build that eternal house that, that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, when this earthly tabernacle or this earthly tent has dissolved down here, I have another building. A building of God made by the hands of God, not made by hand. So when the senior saints who live in a wooden house, 
talked about sending up timber, what they're saying is, I'm doing what God would have me to do down here so I can have a reward over there. And one of those rewards is the fact that I'm going to live with God from now on Amen. in a house that's not made by hands. Amen. Eternal in the heavens. There's that word again, eternal in the heavens. A house not made by hands. So what, what have we agreed on tonight concerning rewards? That you don't receive them and you, you receive them from the work that you do down here. Okay, you receive rewards based on the work you do down here and I get that script before you later. Anybody else? The next question. Who goes before the great white throne and who goes before the judgment seat of Christ? Who goes before the great white throne and who goes before the judgment seat of Christ? Somebody tell me. Talk, talk to me. Brother Johnny Taylor. The people online saying, he got Johnny Taylor at his church. <laughs> yeah, we got Johnny Taylor over here. They're going to break out of the song. We're going to put him in the choir tonight. Well, 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 what I got is they seen those who have died and they are seeing both small and great to record from the dead and stand before Jesus. Sitting on the great white throne. Judgment. Say that again. Now. I'm trying to make sure I, I get what you're saying. Okay, it says, seeing those who have died and death seeing both small and great, resurrection okay, from the dead and stand before Jesus, sitting on the great white throne. Judgment. The great white throne judgment. Key word here is those who died in their sin. Am I understanding what you're saying? Yeah. What scripture are we talking here? The great white throne judgment. Great white throne judgment. What scripture are we talking? The great white throne judgment. Those who died in their sin. Now, when it talks about those who died in their sin, it's not talking about people who died while they were sinning. Right? Because right? you can die in your sin, die while you're sinning and still not go before the great white throne judgment. So tell me, who is this group of people that's going before the great white throne judgment? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I have, it's where Satan, his fallen angels, and unbelievers are judged. It is the last judgment before all who oppose God are cast into the lake of fire. Okay, so the great white throne judgment is for non-believers. The great white throne judgment are for those who have not received Jesus Christ as their Savior. The great white throne judgment are for those who do not have eternal life. Yes? No? Yes? Yes. So the great white throne judgment, as Brother Johnny Taylor has told us, is for those who, who died in their sin, who never received Jesus Christ as their Savior never received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Sister Paul says she's talking about rewards. If we work down here, we will get our reward in heaven. Yes. So the great white throne judgment is for those who will be judged after they leave here who have not received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Okay, who wants to look at the next one? Um, the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment Seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. Who's ready? The judgment seat of Christ, the judgment. What group of people will go before the judgment seat of Christ? Believers. Believers. Though, what, define believers for me, because I, I believe the sky is blue. Am I going before the judgment seat of Christ? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Those who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and accepted him as their Lord and Savior. Okay, the, the believers in Jesus Christ, and what do we believe by him? We believe that the death, burial, and resurrection is what qualifies us <coughs> to go to heaven. Amen. That there's no other way to get to heaven, there's no other way to get to God other than through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was at a church teaching evangelism this is many years ago, and sometimes I can get pretty blatant in my statement. Yes? Mm -hmm. 
And I said that if you if you say that you received Jesus, you say that you've been saved without trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection, then you are not saved. And one lady challenged that. My statement is, if you say that you're saved, if you say that you are a Christian, if you say that you're born again, and you don't believe that Jesus died and rose again, and believe that that is the way to be saved, then you are not saved. And in essence, you're not going to heaven. It's cold turkey, but it's good when you're hungry. What does that mean? Is the truth. Okay? So the great white throne judgment is reserved for what group? The believers. The, uh, the, 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 the white throne. Great white throne judgment is for non believers or unbelievers, right? So everything we do on planet Earth, we're going to be judged about it. We're going to be judged because of it. This great White throne judgment is for what? Non-believers. The judgment seat of Christ. The key here is the judgment seat of Christ. Christians, Christians, Christians will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. So just like unbelievers are going to be judged for the stuff they do, believers are going to be judged for what they do. And our rewards will be dependent on what we do. I'm still thinking about when I put that boy head in the dishwater. God's going to judge me for that. But I'm already getting my story together. He tried to beat me up in my house. I, Lord, I had to defend my, I, my what's the term they use now? My, my life was I feared for my life. I'm getting my story together. But God is going to judge me for holding his head in the dishwater. And then when I let him up, he was still talking trash. I put him in there again. And the Lord is going to judge me for every time I dipped him in the dishwater. That was my last life, y'all. Don't look at me like that. That was the other life. I didn't even know Jesus then. <laughs> but God is going to judge me for it. And y'all, y'all judge me for it now. Y'all, the, the young folks that don't judge me. <laughs> the, young, the young people that don't judge me. Now they say that when they want to do whatever they want to do, right? So we got it clear. When we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, Christians will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. The great white throne judgment Non-believers are those who don't believe in Jesus Christ and have not accepted to receive him as their personal savior. They will be judged at the great white throne judgment. The other thing we talked about is hypostatic union. Spell hypostatic union for me. H-Y-P-O-S-T-A-T-I-C. Okay. H-Y-P-O-S-T-A-T-I-C, the hypostatic union. What is the hypostatic union? Because that's the first thing we're going to talk about in the first paragraph. What is the hypostatic union? The hypostatic union. This is both fully man and uh, fully God and fully man. Who's fully man and fully God? Jesus. Jesus is, right? So, say, you can get my other book off my desk. Please. So, the hypostatic union says that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And because Jesus is fully God and fully man, Jesus is all God and all man. He is the only God man. When we talk about preachers, we say he is the man of God, but he's not the God man. Jesus is the only God man. He is the only one who's God, and he's the only one who is God and man. He is the God man. Another thing you can write down, we refer to Jesus as the Son of God, and we refer to Jesus as the Son of Man. There's a difference. We're talking about the same Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. 
He is the Son of Man, and He is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man because He was born of a woman. Brother Johnson, Brother Andrew Johnson. He is the Son of God because He is God. He is the Son of Man because He was born of a woman. He is human and he is spirit. He is God. Questions or comments? There is no one like Jesus. I don't care how holy you are. I don't care how long you've been saved. And the fact that you had to be saved is an indication that you're not Jesus. David Koresh. Tell me about David Koresh. Who is David Koresh? He had followers. He had a cult. Where was he? What was David Koresh? Waco. Waco, the Waco massacre, right? They call it a massacre massacre because David Koresh had these people in bondage. He had said that he was the Messiah. He was reading the book of Revelation to them. Right down the road in Waco, Texas. He, he said that he was the Messiah. How do we know he wasn't the Messiah? Give me one reason why you know he wasn't. He's dead. I want to tell you Jesus still lived. How do I know he lived? He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I'm his own. He's my loving brother, my loving father. He is still living. What's another reason we know David Koresh is not Jesus? Hmm? He's a man. He's a man. Was Jesus a man, right? They know who his parents are. Oh, they know his parents, and they know his parents wasn't Mary and Joseph. What's another way we know he's not Jesus? He's just 100% human. He's just 100% human. He's not 100% God. He's not 100% man. What's the other reason we know David Koresh was not Jesus, was not the Messiah? Because Jesus came to set the captive free, he was holding people captive. What's another reason we know he's not Jesus? Because he didn't ride in here on a cloud. Jesus coming back on a cloud. The same way he left. In the book of Acts the, the, uh, and in Mark the, the disciples were standing there gazing and looking up in the sky as Jesus left. The angel said, why stand you here gazing? The same Jesus that left you on a cloud, guess how he's coming back? He's coming back on a cloud. The same Jesus. David Koresh didn't come on a cloud. What's another way we know he wasn't Jesus? He wasn't the Messiah. Who is a Guyana tragedy guy? Guyana. Remember Guyana? Jim Jones. It was hard to be called Jim Jones during those days. If you had a name Jim Jones, you were in trouble. Because they were gonna they were gonna jank you, boy. They were gonna pull your chain. So Jim Jones, what what happened with the people that followed Jim Jones? He convinced people to drink part of the Kool-Aid and those that didn't drink it, he took care of them. He killed them. Had them killed, bro. Have you ever heard the this, this statement, they have drank the Kool-Aid? That statement was around before Jim Jones, but now it has become a reality. They drank the Kool-Aid. What does that mean when they say they drank the Kool-Aid? What does that mean? Okay, people who were with Jim Jones, drank the Kool-Aid, they died. But what does the phrase itself mean? They drank the Kool-Aid. They're following somebody that's, that's not right. They follow somebody that's not right, and that person who is not right has convinced them that he is who he say he is. Yes. I literally spent three hours today talking to a brother who have chosen to follow somebody that I have chosen not to follow. Y'all got it, huh? And 
over 80 million people have drank the Kool-Aid. They have drank the Kool-Aid. The last thing we had, last part of homework, was salvation, eternal salvation. Paul Stan Charles Stanley has a book out that he's made two, second and third edition. It's called Eternal Security. Eternal Security. You may want to read that book, may want to look at it, may want to get a Kindle of it. He talks about eternal security. It's a whole book on just that one phrase, eternal security. And through that book, he talks about our salvation being eternal. Jesus says, I offer you eternal life. What does the word eternal mean? Sister Bjorn? Forever. Forever. Everlasting. And at what point does eternal stop being eternal? So forever, ever, ever, and ever means eternity, right? And if it means eternity, it means from now on, right? From the moment you receive Jesus Christ, you have eternal security. This word, Paul, Charles Stanley talks about this word, eternal security, means that not only do you have eternal life, forever life, but you are secure with Jesus Christ. And the reference, uh, reference scripture here is John chapter 10, verses 24 through 30. John chapter 10, verses 24 through 30. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says to them, he says, you don't know me because you're not a part of my sheepfold. He says, but those who are a part of my sheepfold hear my voice. They know me, first of all. They know me. I know them. They hear my voice and they will not follow a stranger. And then he goes on and say, I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. Questions or comments? Questions or comments? So let's look at page number 17 in our book, day number three. We um, who started reading, when you read your scripture first and then read the paragraph for us, please. The scripture is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. What, what's the name of this, this session we in today? Get, get right in the middle. Go right. What's the name of this session we in right now? What's the name of this setting we in right now? We in Bible study. What does Bible study suggest? We're going to study the Bible. If we're going to study the Bible, then what is that what we ought to do? We ought to have a bank. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Philippians, let's look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Everybody's coming to everybody's rescue. Oh, Philippians geez. chapter 2. Philippians oh, chapter 2. Yeah, Philippians chapter 2. Verses 5 through 8. Philippians chapter 2. Verses 5 through 8. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Okay, in paragraph. <clears throat> uh, learning to be a servant of God. Many scripture passages describe Jesus as God's servant. He came as a servant to accomplish God's will to redeem humanity. Here is what Paul said about Jesus. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Thank you. So this word here is where we found this, this particular passage 
of uh, the text that the author writes about is when we find what we call the hypostatic union. It says that Jesus did not call it robbery. He did not consider it robbery. In other words, Jesus did not get upset because he had to come to planet Earth as a man. Why did Jesus have to come to planet Earth as a man? Say again. Can nobody else get it right but him? Could no one get us right other than Jesus, right? So Jesus came to earth and he came to earth as a man. And he wasn't upset about it. How many of you get upset when the pastor tells us what some do? Just <laughs> one person in the whole building. Praise the Lord. Out of 500 people, y'all, only one person gets upset. When the pastor asked him to do something, hallelujah. Boy, I'm a blessed pastor. <laughs> I'm blessed of the Lord, hallelujah. Now, if I can get that one right, maybe I can get the 5,000 right. <laughs> so, so Jesus didn't get upset about it. He didn't consider it an atmosphere that they were robbing him of his deity. He's still God. Yes. It's like when somebody talked to you crazy, you still who you are. You still have the value you had, but somebody just talked to you crazy. Have somebody ever talked to you crazy? You just sit there and look at them and just look through them. And you had a blank look on your face because you had a whole lot of stuff in your heart and your head. Anybody been there? Jesus did not consider it robbery. But he made himself for no reputation. He did not get upset about it. He left his heavenly throne in heaven and came to planet Earth. And when he walked these mundane shores, he came here to save us. Matthew, Mark, and Luke says he came as a servant. They said he came as a Messiah. But John says he came to give his life. What are the synoptic gospels? Synoptics. Synoptics. S Y N O T I C. The synoptic. S Y N O T I C. S Y N O T I C. The synoptic gospels. What are, we have how many gospels writers? Four, right? What are they? Or who are they? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are some that are known as the synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the reason why they are called the synoptic gospels is because all three of them write similarly about certain things, or they write the same stories over and over again. John is not included in the synoptic gospels because John writes about Jesus being a suffering savior that has come to give his life for mankind. That's why in John chapter three, Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you can't even understand nor see the kingdom of heaven. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his life. He gave his only begotten son. This word begotten means his one of a kind son. His, this word begotten means his unique son. There is none like him. Only unique son. Only begotten son. Only one of a kind son. He's unique. John said he came to give his life. Now what are the three, what are the four gospels? Matthew, Mark, Matthew, Mark Luke, and John. What are the synoptic gospels? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is not included in what we know as the synoptic gospels because John takes a total different look and paints a total different picture from the other three. Many times you can look at the same stories in these three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but you can't find them in John. Yes? Yes. I even have a book that's called the synoptic gospels. Doesn't have John in there at all. It's those three. And it gives Bible verses and tells you Matthew, Mark, and Luke and where they line up and tell the same story. 
When you look at Matthew chapter 5, there's a man running crazy in the graveyard. I mean, Mark chapter 5, I'm sorry. Mark chapter 5, there's a man running crazy in the graveyard. I think it's Luke that talks about two men living in the graveyard. So they give their different perspectives about the same story. Mark just points out one man. The Bible says that this man threatened people as they walked by. They chained him and he broke the chain. No man could chain him. He had supernatural power. Verses 1 through 5 says he was threatening people when they walked through the graveyard. Verses 1 through 5 says that he was dead. He was living among the dead. In the, he was living, living among the dead, a live man living among the dead. And verse number 6 says it like this. But when he saw Jesus, he ran and bowed down before him. The same man that was threatening other people, the same man that was breaking shackles and chains, the same man bowed down before Jesus because Jesus is God. Second paragraph. Your scripture is Matthew 20, 26 through 28. Matthew 20, 26 through 28. Same Matthew 20, 26 through 28. Matthew, Matthew 20. Can you use that mic for me? Oh, All right, thank you. Oh. Matthew chapter 20, 26. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve and to give his life for, give his life a ransom for many. In his instructions to the disciples, Jesus, the Son of Man, described his own role of servanthood this way. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first, you must be your slave. Just as Son of Man did not come to serve, but to, to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus also identified what our relationship with him looks like. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Okay, that's John 20 and 21. So when we look at this, thank you. When we look at this passage, these two passages of scripture, Remember now, it says the Son of Man. What do we discover about the Son of Man? When we use the word Son of Man, what does that mean? Jesus. Okay, it means Jesus. Jesus. But when we call Jesus the Son of Man, what are we talking about? 100% um, man. We talk about his human form, right? Because he was born of a woman or born of a man. He was born of a woman. When he used the word man, it's talking about Mary, right? When we use the word Son of God, what are we talking about? He's born of God, right? He's born of the Holy Spirit. So make sure you understand this. Jesus came to not be served, but Jesus came to serve. What it's saying is Jesus humbled himself so much till he became a servant, made himself a man. He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve us and to serve others. That's what mission trips are all about. He's, we have come to serve others. We have come to serve others and not to be served. But when you're on mission, nobody's going to carry your bag. They tell you point blank. Don't take any more you can carry. Because some people will take everything but the kitchen sink. You're going to be there five days. You're going to be working during the day. You're going to be serving other people during the day. We're going to have revival at night. No one on that team should have had any more bags or any more clothing than me. Because I had to serve. Boy, I ain't never carried so much, uh, so much sheetrock and paste and tape and floating in all my days. But regardless of who I was or what kind of preacher I was, during the day I was a servant. And holding Brother Johnson holding sheep rock over your head is no fun. <laughs> hey, man, hurry up and screw that one in. Hurry up and put that one in. Uh, well, you just hold it. <laughs> I, I'm coming. You, you just wait till I get there. 
and I'm standing on a, a scaffold, and and then we gotta do the do the dance, uh, this cha cha to get around each other on the scaffold because they don't have scaffolds with all these boards like we have. They have one two by four here and another one there and one going across there, and you gotta tap dance to get to it. And we pay $1,200 to go oh, no. of our money. <laughs> now, you going on missions and you paying money. Mm. I don't know where Pastor Hope would get this $1,100 from. They must, I'm, they must owe me some money. <laughs> and then they try to charge me a late fee, tell me too late. No, I just heard about the trip. I'm not late. I'm going to give you $1,200 and I'm done. Mm. You paying money to go serve somebody else. But that's what Jesus would do. And then out of all day of working, you go back and you take a shower and you come right back down there to the, that little church where you got doors open. We got air conditioning here. They had open doors with no fans. And sand flies will eat you alive. And sand flies are not flies like we know them. When you Google it, it'll tell you that the sand flies are unseen. <laughs> and they just bite. They just bite. You can be dead to sleep at night. They let you know they're there. You can't see them. They're sand flies. And the ones in the encyclopedia and on Google, they, they have magnified them thousands of times just so you can see what they look like. But you go to serve. And ask me when I go back, I will go back another time. And I'll go back another time because you're here to serve. Amen. How many of you are here at this church and on this earth to serve? Yeah, Jesus that. sets the example to serve. And guess what? It didn't matter what the chore was, you got to serve wherever you call to serve. Mm. Ushers shouldn't mind singing in the choir. Choir members shouldn't mind ushering. Uh, none of us should mind picking up paper and mopping and sweeping. And don't talk about we got somebody, we paid to do this. <laughs> Preachers make fun of me when we go out to eat. And after we finish eating, we're sitting there talking. And I'm stacking plates on top of each other. And I'm wiping down in front of me. And I'm wiping down in front of them. They said, man, they got people they pay to do this. But why would I want to sit here with stuff in front of me? Can't even put my elbow down. I got grease all up my elbow. It does not hurt to serve. It doesn't cost anything to serve. Jesus came to serve and to give his life. Third paragraph. Third paragraph. We go back to the question about servant. Third paragraph. Now in this paragraph, there was something said that I haven't understood yet. And you ought to have a question about it too if you study. The third paragraph. Paragraph three. Was your definition similar to A? You do those questions first. Though. No, no, no. Just, just go with. It. Okay. That's A, sir. Was your definition similar to definition similar to A? A servant finds out what his master wants him to do and does it. The world's concept of a servant is that a servant goes to the master and says, Master, what do you want me to do? The master tells him, and the servant goes off by himself and does it. That is not the biblical concept of being a servant of God. Being a servant of God is different from being a servant of a human master. A servant of a human master works for his master. God, however, works through his servants. Okay, thank you. So look at what look at what it says, and I guess I'm not the smartest knife in the uh, sharpest knife in the drawer, or the smartest smartest person in the room. So I need y'all to help me with this. He gives a definition. The author does. He gives a definition of a worldly servant, and he says the servant goes to his master and ask his master, what do you want me to do? The master tells him what he wants him to do, and the master go, the servant goes and do what the master said do. And in my opinion, that's what I ought to do. <laughs> but the author says, I'm thinking like a worthy man. He says, 
The master tells the servant what to do, and then the servant go and get it done. He goes off by himself and get it done. And then he says that the God's way of doing things is that God, however, works through his servants. Now, Brother Woodlock, you're going to have to tell me what he's doing. You're going to tell me what he means. Somebody got to tell me what he's doing. He's talking about. He says, the servant goes and gets done what the master asked him to do. But he classifies that as a worldly form of servant doing. Brother Whitlock is going to educate us on this tonight. <laughs> got these theologians in here tonight. I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with, with the, I, I think what he's saying is with the human master, the servant runs off to do the task uh, on his own will or on or on his own with his own power. But with 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 God, God will provide you with the with the tools and he'll provide you with the strength and and he'll he'll give you power to go off and do the task that he wants you to do. Okay, everybody heard that? The theologian has spoken. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what he's saying, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, he's saying that when a master instructs a servant on what to do in the world, the servant hears what the master says, the servant runs off on his own and by himself. The, 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 the author says, by himself, and he has it in italicis, so that says something to us. He runs off by himself, and he gets the task done. But Brother Whitlock says, when it's come to God, God gives us the strength to get it done, and we're not doing it under our own power. We're doing it under God's power. Because the author does say, God works through the servant to get the job done. Aren't y'all glad I had that question that y'all had too? <laughs> God works through us to get things done. How many of you know there are just some things you can't get done on your own? If we could do everything on our own, this whole world would look different. I don't know if it would be different for the better or the worse, though. I do know if we can do get everything done on our own, a lot of selfishness would be out here. Even more than what we see now. Because God allowed men to do what men do, right? He doesn't make them do it, but he allowed them to do it. And men do things on their own, and we are in a mess now because men do things on their own. That's right. But when we allow God, thank you, brother. With a lot of men, I, I've been praying over this, and God gets sent you by. <laughs> when God works through us, when God uses us, when God blesses us, and when God does things with us. Then it comes into fruition without us. Dr. Tony Evans says there's a difference between a blessing and a miracle. Dr. Tony Evans says that God gives us gifts when we do things on our own. Good things. So you can do things on your own and God is able to bless you. But what he says is when you have a miracle, it is something that God defeats all of his own laws to make it happen for you. Yes? So what he says is that everything lines up. The idea is if you work, you have money, you pay your bills. Pretty natural, right? God blesses you with health. He blesses you with strength. You work, you pay bills, you keep your house. But what Dr. Evans is saying, that the work pay bill principle doesn't work when it comes to a miracle. It says that God skips over all of these plans and make things happen on your behalf, and that's a miracle. He defies all odds. How many of y'all been praying for a miracle? Just one person, two persons? You've been praying for a miracle? So what you ask asking God is, 
God blessed me with a job. God blessed me to be able to pay my bills. God blessed me with a car. Because if you give me money, I can pay for a car. You don't have to be a Christian to have a nice car. Matter of fact, most of the time, people who don't, who are not Christian, have nicer cars. God blesses us if we are obedient to God, we do the principles, we work the plan, God blesses us. But sometimes we can do the principles, work the plans, we are blessed, and we say hallelujah, we thank God for it, but there are just some instances in our lives that man reasoning, man's work, cannot get it done. September 5th, 1995, they rolled me in the hospital to have open heart surgery. I'm laying on the table. And the doctor comes to my side and says, I'm counseling the surgery. The doctor didn't do anything. So I began to question him while I was laying there. I said, well, doctor, what do you contribute to? He said, over a period of time, it just healed itself. I said, doc, you don't think it was no divine intervention? He said, oh, no, oh, no. Over a period of time, it just healed itself. I said, Doctor, something that I've had for the last 32 years, a problem that's been with me for 32 years that I knew was a problem, my family knew it was a problem, everybody around me knew it was a problem. Now you telling me it healed itself in four months? He said, well, I don't see on September 5th what I saw on May 17th. I said, Doc, you don't think there was any divine intervention? No, it just healed itself. I said, well, Doc, I'm glad you used the word heal. Because man can treat, but only God can heal. All right. That was a miracle. I shouted it from the rooftop. I challenged the doctor. And I couldn't get him to admit that it was a miracle from heaven. But I left there knowing. That is something that the doctor didn't do. It's something that I couldn't do. It's something that medicine couldn't do. But God did it. It was more than a blessing. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. I'm telling you, God is in the miracle working business. He's able to do it. And therefore, we can't shout. We can't wait to shout. We got to shout in the midst of it. In the midst of its coming. And, and before it gets to us. While things are still bad, while things are still not our own, and things are not our way, we got to shout right now. right now. When you walk in faith, you're able to shout when you're going through. Yeah, right. Look what Jesus did. It's a, he's a servant. The question, based on the scriptures that have been read previously, and others, are, are you comfortable with having... The, the identity of being a servant of God. Are you comfortable? Are you, come on, be real with me. Are you really a servant of God? Are you a sometime servant, a part-time servant? Are you a servant that does what you want to do? I'm going to serve here and I'm going to serve with all I have. But when they ask me to serve over there, can't do that. Because I was doing fine just, just kind of watching the guy sawing and and putting screws in there and putting tape. My first job was to tape it, and then the guys come behind me and float. But all of a sudden, I found myself migrating over there where they were sawing the wood, and that's where the heavy lifting was, was going on. Now I got a whole sheetrock over my head. I could have said, you know, I'm the preacher now. I, I ain't never been doing that. But we are called to serve wherever we can serve because God blesses us to serve. Amen. And in the midst of God blessing us to serve, guess what happened? Miracles take place. Yeah. When you serve, God will do some things that defiles all the odds. That's why I tell people, be consistent. Do, do what God's called you to do and do it with all you have. The reason why I put so much energy into children is number one, I'm called to do it. Number two is because if I put energy in somebody else's child and my child gets to the point where they won't listen to me, God will send somebody by to put energy 
into my child like I put energy into somebody else's life. That's why Sister Andrew Johnson sent his daughter to this church. Because <laughs> when he can't speak in her life, maybe I can. Are you with me? Because God has a way of blessing our children through somebody else. Because there's going to come a point in their lives where they won't listen to you. And the same thing you've been telling them for 18, 15, 20 years, somebody walks up in one breath and say the same thing you've been telling them for 20 years and the light bulb goes off. They act like that's the greatest revelation, revelation ever. Right Prime example is the military. Now you raise these jokers to make up their bed and been begging them, pick up their shoes, begging them to, to do the right thing for 18, 19 years. They go to the military and in three months they come back, they can't stand the bed not made up. It took a drill sergeant hollering at them every day and calling them nasty names and cussing them out. And now you can flip a coin on their bed and that coin will skip and hop. And the same thing you've been telling me for years. God blesses us and creates miracles in our presence when we just follow God's holiness. Number two, briefly describe a time when you gave your best effort for God but felt frustrated that little or no lasting results took place. Give your best effort. You, when, when was it that you gave your very best effort you end up being frustrated because God didn't come through like you want to come through. Anybody got an example? Oh, y'all so holy. Yes, sir. I guess mine is just just a little bit different. Uh, sometimes when I when I teach, mm -hmm. um, it's real hard, or or rather, it's not evident to me that that the lesson was received or understood outside of the people that's actually sitting inside the church. So, so we're online, but I, I can't gauge uh, the reception of the lesson mm -hmm. from anybody who might watch the lesson. So you can get frustrated when you do things over and over again and, and say things over and over again, and it looks like nobody's listening. The first night of revival in Belize, the guy came to me that was leading leading the group. He came to me and he said, Pastor, now I just want to let you know, don't get discouraged. They 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 sit and they they look at you, but they really listening to you. I said, man, I can't get discouraged. For the last 20 years, I've been watching folk look at me and I didn't know what they got. <laughs> I said, this is the wrong guy you talking to if you think I'm gonna get discouraged. I mean, I said, I've been pastoring in May, in, in September, it will be 20 years. And for 20 years, I watched people come and go. I watched people lie to me about, I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. And I watched people sit and look at me. And I said to myself, I know that's what the words say. I said, man, you talking to the wrong guy. I said, you may want to talk to Pastor Augers or Pastor Holman, and, and they may get discouraged, but there is no way for me to get discouraged. None whatsoever. I've been watching that a watching a number of people look at me like a calf looking at a brand new kid for twenty years, and before that for thirty two years, and before that since I've been twelve, I've been teaching Sunday school. I watch people not respond the way I think they respond. But yeah, check this out, brother Willow. When you ask them questions they are able to give it back to you biblically. Well, watch our children. We think they're not listening. And then, all of a sudden, they're able to regurgitate what you said. So we can't gauge it on what it looks like, because God is always making things happen. The last question. What is a servant? Define in your own words what's a servant. What is a servant? Hmm? A worker. Willing worker. Faith. Matter of fact, there's a there's a group of people in one church called the Willing Workers. Also, there's a church named Willing Working Church. Yeah. It suggests that people willingly work. You don't have to beg them. You don't have to pump them in front. They're willing work. Anybody else? 
Anybody else? What's the servant? What is the attitude of a servant? Based on Philippians chapter 2. What is the attitude of a servant? Cheerful, good attitude, Obedient. willing to work, looking for work, looking for somewhere to bless, some people to bless. How I many of you ever felt guilty that you didn't do it? Or you had the wrong attitude? And I'm not talking about when somebody came to you and said, you got a funky attitude. <laughs> I'm talking about when God convicted your heart and you knew you should have done it. I was a brand new pastor at the New Beginning Church and I went to visit a lady at the hospital. And you know, one thing I'm going to do if I go to the hospital jail, I'm going to ask about their salvation. So I went to the hospital and this one time has been haunting me for 20 years. I went to the hospital and when I got there, the lady was spry. She was laying in the bed, but she was talking and, and uh, then I walked out the room and I left and then I got in the car and I was like, man, I didn't lead her to Christ. And before I got back the next day, the woman was dead. That has been haunting me for 20 years. The woman died overnight. I went on what the doctor said. Oh, she's doing better than she was doing. Because the reason why I went there, they said that she wouldn't make it through the next night, right? Well, she made it through that night. She was doing good. And we got to talking to the family and we just kind of fellowshipping. And I walked out, and by the time I got to the car, I said, man, I didn't leave this woman to Christ. I didn't evaluate her like I used the wood. And the next day, the family said, she's dead and gone. I felt that big. Because I didn't do what God has called me to do. She may have been saved. But I didn't do. I did not serve. I did not do what God called me to do. I missed an opportunity. To this day, I feel that big. Have you had those times when you walk past somebody and you just didn't do what God wanted you to do? I had the skills. I had the know-how. I've done deathbed confessions so many times before. But that one time stands out in my mind more than all of the other times I've been for the Christ. And guess what I asked the Lord? Lord, if you give me another chance, I'll serve you to the balance of my days. I'll get it right this time. How many times you had to serve or you had an opportunity to serve? Whether it's working, whether it's leading somebody to Christ, whether it's feeding somebody, how many times you passed that opportunity up? And the Holy Spirit was asking you to do what you call to do. I like to watch people do things when I say, hey, why don't you get this done? Why don't you get this done? Why don't you get this done? God is asking us to get stuff done with no excuses. That's what Jesus did. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that he humbled himself all the way to the cross, all the way to death. And that's what Jesus did. So we're going to be picking up next week. Um, right here where it says uh, parting with clay somebody already got that right we'll pick that up next week and just remember Christ sets the example he died for you he was buried for you he rose for you John says he came to give his life he came to give his life for you and for me that we will have eternal life unto death if you've not received Jesus as your savior this is your moment Try Jesus right now. The door of the church is open. You can receive him by just believing in the story that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried on the barbed tomb. And he rose from the dead. Would you bow your head with me and invite Christ into your life? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. Make me a new person. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, you're now born again, you're on your way to heaven, and when you die, you will reside with God himself. If you need a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church, where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Inbox us and let us know if you receive Jesus Christ and if you want to join the New Beginning Church, whether locally or globally, we welcome you to be a member of the church. It is oftentimes it's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can give electronically by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it in to P.O. Box 503. Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand. Lord, we thank you for this privilege of giving. We ask you to bless every giver in Jesus' name. I mean, the praise report or prayer request. Praise reports or prayer request. Yes, sir. Prayer request for the safe travel for Whitlocks. Safe travel for the Whitlocks. We are praying for the Whitlocks as they go from Houston to Pearland. We are praying for the Whitlocks. <laughs> we are praying for the Whitlocks as they travel from Texas to Alabama. I'm going to tell you, in Houston, you better pray when you go from Houston to Houston. You got you to pray if you're going from Houston to Houston. So we, we're praying for the Whitlocks as they travel uh, down the dangerous highways and highways. And as they travel in the air, we're praying for, for the Whitlocks. We're praying that God control the plane, control the pilot, that the Airline attendants have good attitude and serve them well, and, and that they they are blessed going up, blessed in flight, and blessed coming down. Amen. 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 While we stand to be dismissed, for all the senior citizens ages 62 and up, we're going out to eat uh, in the month of May, first Saturday in the month of May. We're going out to eat. I need you to give me your name and do uh, some um, RSVP. We need to know how many number of people. If you're 62 and up, we're taking our 62 and up out to eat and fellowship, having games and fun, all of you who are 62 and up. And I will say you can have a plus one. And get, oh, let me make sure y'all know what a plus one is. The senior people, y'all know what I didn't think y'all did. Google it. <laughs> Google it. We, you can have a plus one, but we need a number of uh, who's coming and how many people are coming. Amen. So we want to fellowship with our 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 senior saints. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for those who are. Traveling, we thank you for the Whitlocks. We ask you to bless their lives, give them safe passage, Father God. Go before them, Father God, keep them safe and bless them, Father God, as they move through the air, as they move on the ground. Bless their lives and bless those who will be with them and bless those who will be around them. Give them opportunity to lead people to Christ. Bless them and be living, talking, walking examples of servanthood that men will come and ask, what must I do to be saved? Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, we ask you, Father God, to bless our lives. Unto him who is able to present a spotless before the own, only wise God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.